Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer and tonight we look at how you can get into investing ethically in one trade with the CEO of listed company Australian Ethical Investment, John McMurdo. And then Paul Ricard looks at the companies that should see their share prices rise because of the budget and all the largesse that's out there from the Treasurer. And then Paul Mirren of M Square Capital looks at what are your investment options with inflation on the rise. But before all that, I have been asked if the sell-off of tech companies recently creates a buying opportunity. And the answer is yes, but you might have to wait a while before you actually see some decent returns. Here are some local companies caught in the market downdraft, and I will show you what the consensus of expert analysts are saying about these companies and where they think share prices will eventually head. You can see their Appen 98.1%, Afterpay 36.3%, Altium, 38.3%, Wisetech, 22.5%. Now, I've always said, if these guys who pick and look at these companies are only half right, over two years the gains will be very good. Now, take Appen, for example. Uh, that would be, if you take half the 98%, you get 49% over two years, and that's pretty good when you consider that would be about 25% per annum. Tech companies will come again, and that will be when fund managers say, we've paid too much for these value companies, and they'll start taking profit. And they'll say, gee, those tech stocks look attractive at such low prices. And remember, the good companies in the tech space are businesses of the new world. That means they have a real future. But if you are an inhabitant of the new world, you might have to learn about something from the old world to make money, and that's called patience. So let's kick off with the CEO of Australian Ethical Investment, John McMurdo. Well, it's certainly a time to think about investing ethically. It is a very popular trend, and even the governments of the world are now getting more ethical than ever before. And joining me now is the CEO of Australian Ethical Investment Limited, John McMurdo. John, thanks for coming to the program. Good to be here, Peter. Now, a lot of people, and I know a lot of younger people who watch this program, are really keen to invest ethically. So why don't you explain what the company is and what is the basis upon which you guys make money, which ultimately creates the profits, that explains why the share price has done brilliantly since 2019. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And, and, and Peter, I think the short answer to that is, um, yes, we're an ASX. Uh, listed company, mm. uh, so a public company. Uh, we are an investment management business, uh, so that's our, our whole reason for being, and, and, and more important than just an investment management business, we're an ethical uh, mm. investment management business. That's all we do and everything mm. uh, we do. It's not an add-on to something else. Uh, yeah. This is this is our specialist domain, mm. uh, but you're right, investors uh, are able to join us uh, investing in a range of funds mm. uh, that we have, including superannuation. Uh, that's easy to do mm. uh, via our website. Uh, but that's investing uh, your personal you know, assets and portfolio. Mm. Separately, um, uh, shareholders are able to invest in the head company, yeah. uh, but quite different things. And, and that's the, the, the company that you see on screen now, now as ticker code is AEF. And, and I, I guess I, I want to get to the, the heart of this because um, you've got different funds. I, f I figure the biggest one is your Australian Shares Fund? Is it? Australian Shares is large. Right. Uh, also our diversified uh, fund, which invests across a range of asset classes, so that, yeah. that's more diversified. Um, increasingly, funds like our Emerging Companies Fund, mm. uh, which invests in you know, some of the new world sectors, yeah. biotech, uh, health, uh, et cetera, yeah. uh, increasingly growing. But, but, but you're right, Australian Shares is very strong. Okay, and so for that, what kind of filters do you put over it to include companies? And I'm, why am I asked that question is, I'm wondering whether Woolworths would be out because of its link to alcohol, but when it dumps Endeavour drinks, well, or <laughs> lists Endeavour drinks, will it become m more in the ethical space? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question because I think this is where, where specialist managers come into their own, you know, with with, you know, in our instance, a dedicated ethics team mm. uh, headed by Dr. Stuart Palmer. And, and their job is to, is to uh, ask all of these questions, make these assessments using our frameworks uh, and, and come to judgments. Mm. Uh, and of course, um, sometimes it's not that easy because oh. a, as you say, companies transition, the shape of them changes and, and what may not have met one of our filters 
previously mm. um, may start to um, if they're genuinely on a journey mm. uh, to uh, to you know a, a better place uh, and and it can go the other way as well mm. uh, so important to take a an active management approach and, and really deeply engage uh, with mm. every company you know you know Peter we, we engaged with more than 400 companies last year in mm. their boardroom yeah. with CEOs asking the tough questions mm. and, and, I, and I think that's an important part of what we do yeah so you're not prepared to talk about the Woolworths thing yet, because that's, that's not your job really, you're the CEO of the company, but there'd be some fund managers who have to answer that question. But I guess the interesting point is that there's a lot more people, particularly younger people, who can't really raise much money through term deposits, who've come to the stock market, and they are really interested in investing in companies that have a, a real ethical spin, aren't they? They are, there's no question, and in fact, um, not just younger people, um, which is... No, we older people care about the, <laughs> the environment and, and, and whatever. And, and increasingly so. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, that's been really interesting in the data that we've seen. Because you're exactly right. If we went back even two years, Peter, um, you know, our, our data would have said it was certainly the millennials, you know, who are more interested yeah. uh, in the style of investing, you know, probably looking further into the future and yeah. looking both at investment fundamentals, but also what sort of planet and society they, yeah. they, they want to have. Uh, but, you know, the data now tells us, and probably two key data points here is, I think last year, the Responsible Investment Association came out with a report that said, you know, that, that interest in invest, investing in this manner had moved from something in the order of 15% of Australians mm. to something in the order of two-thirds to even 80% oh. who, who were interested, you know, or at least prepared to consider yeah. it. And I think, yeah. and I think even, you know, probably the, the one that hit home for me was uh, just last month, uh, Independent Research House Investment Trends um, ran a similar analysis with more than 3,000 Australians, 300 plus uh, financial advisors, and that said, um, as of today, about a third of the country now is is either investing ethically in some way and wants to do more of it. Mm. But I, I think the real fascinating point of that was, and they coined the cohort the next wave. Mm. It said another 45 percent of Australians in the next 12 months have an intention, mm. you know, to want to either invest or certainly consider. And, and that's a seismic shift in it attitudes. Is. It is. And I know um, when Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister and he was, he was pushing a, a carbon tax, I wrote a book called The Carbon Crunch, which mm -hmm. didn't really do all that well because he actually backed down on his carbon tax <laughs> and, and the Kyoto Principle exactly. and all that sort of stuff. You might it's, want to dust the book off. <laughs> I know. You know. It, it'll, it'll, live, it'll run again. But the, what, the point I made then was that and I, as an economist, I wasn't confident that, that my personal views on the environment were necessarily right. But I said, but the bottom line is, you know, a, a large number of Australians were voting either Green or Labor, mm -hmm. who were who were certainly believing believers, and that's a big chunk of a consumer market. And it explained why Toyota was producing companies called uh, cars like Prius, and Volvo yes, was looking for trucks not. that were running on uh, alternative fuels. And so you could see that even if it's not right science, and yep. I think it is, but even if it's not, the world, if they believe it. The, the companies of the world are going to follow, and that's what we're seeing right oh, now in uh, spades, aren't we, with yeah. electric cars? Oh, and that's exactly right. And the capital markets, as, as we know, Peter, are, are going to follow that quickly. And you yeah. know, um, we can probably talk to that because at a global level, that's happening quickly. Mm. But, but just to, to emphasise your point, um, we're now seeing that it's every segment or demographic. So whereas yeah. it was the millennials, we're yeah. now seeing it's it's the Zoomers and the millennials, but increasingly the pre-retirees, the mm. retirees who have just as much uh, interest mm. uh, and, and propensity. And we're seeing it across political spectrums, social demographics, um, lock, stock and barrel. So it's been, it's been fascinating. And what's interesting, John, is that even if they don't ethically believe in it, because it's a big investing theme, as the old saying, if you're going to do anything, you might as well do it for money. <laughs> I, think, I think that's why the ethical thing will do well. And ultimately, the, the world and the, the climate and the planet will do better, even if only for money reasons. Well, and, and, and that's exactly right, because, you know, you, you know what we're seeing, it's, it's interesting to know that so many are now looking to do this. Hmm. You know, but why is that, is, is what we are most interested in. And, and really, we conclude three things, Peter. First is... Uh, Australians generally in society in recent years uh, have been more interested to associate with brands or companies that, that reflect their personal values. Yeah. And that's not an investing 
you know, viewpoint. Yeah. That's in general yeah. uh, in society. The, the thing then that's been interesting is, as you allude to, investors are opening their eyes to the power of their money. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it is tremendous that uh, more and more we, you know, we're not involved in single-use plastics and, mm. you know, keep cups are emerging and all of those things are fantastic. Yeah. But um, Australians are realising actually the power of their money and where that's invested, you mm. know, into which companies is even more powerful. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think probably the, the clincher is that the sort of myth that had existed previously about performance and investment returns from the style of investing has has been busted. Yeah. Uh, you know the the data internationally as well as domestically from companies like ours, not just over the short term, you know, but on a three year basis, seven year basis, ten year basis, mm -hmm. outperforming other style of investment. I think, and so I think if you staple those issues together, you're yeah. exactly right. Australians are saying, look. Um, this investing can do well for me, uh, but it can also do well, you know, for the planet or society. Yeah. And so why wouldn't I? Yeah, exactly right. And, and the fact that, you know, your share price, particularly since 2019, has really gone for a, a very big rise. To me, it's because everything we've been talking about. But are there any other specific reasons? Was, were there particular funds that so outperformed that... It captured the imagination of others who wanted to invest in real estate. Look, they have, and so you know, if I if I share our performance, you mentioned Australian shares earlier. Um, last year, our Australian shares fund delivered 21% mm. in a pandemic mm. year, mm. Um, but that's not unusual. You know, we look back three, five, seven, ten years. Um, our funds have outperformed their benchmark and are at double digits in all of those on a mm. compounding basis mm. right back for 20 years. Mm. Um, our emerging companies fund last year did 35%. Um, since, since Tech companies will do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and, and they will, but mm. since inception, you know, six, seven years ago, that's done 20% yeah. compound. So, you know, investors are realising this isn't a sort of a flavour of the month or a short-term phenomenon. This is yeah. actually just makes good yeah. investing sense to invest in sectors and companies, you know, that will be part of the, the new world yeah. on a 10, 20, 30 year horizon as opposed to part of the old world. I, I guess one challenge that you must have within the organisation would be that that value judgment you have to make about companies. And I, I know someone said to me recently they looked at a particular fund, which was an ethical fund, and one of the biggest holdings was Zoom. And he kind of laughed. And I said, well, when you think about it, Zoom becomes the alternative to flying around the world, and therefore it reduces the, uh, the need for fuel in aeroplanes, and that's a big pollutant. And he kind of understood it, but other people sort of laughed at the idea, but unless, unless you actually explore the reasons for it, it makes perfect sense. It, it's it's such a vital point, and, mm. and and it is nuanced. And I think this is why you do need dedicated teams to look mm. at this. You know, you and I don't have the time twenty four by seven to look at every single fundamental. Mm. Um, but that's why organisations like ours, who hire professionals to do exactly this, mm. uh, and deep teams of professionals, um, are, are looking to make those judgments and understanding. You know, we, we look at things through both a negative and a positive lens, Peter. So mm. we, we're looking to understand and, and typically filter out uh, businesses that, that sort of tick boxes on a range of negative dimensions yeah. for us. Yeah. Uh, and we're looking for companies that, that sort of tick positive dimensions. But not every company neatly fits into each. No. Sometimes there's a little of that and a lot of this, um, and you need to weigh those things, and, and that's where that deep engagement and active management style approach works. Okay, one last question. Is the universe, when you first started, the universe was in, uh, big, because not many people were chasing it, but are more, because more and more companies are trying to become ethical in the eyes of the customers and potentially investors, is the universe expanding for, for you guys? It, it is, and, and, and we would like to see it expand. You know, we, we think it's healthy uh, to have a, have a strong, flourishing ethical investment community. Mm. Uh, I guess, conversely, our concern, Peter, is you know, what, what some uh, would recognise you know, as the term greenwashing, mm. where 
you know, it's more of a marketing label or it's, uh, you know, a, a little sideshow, mm -hmm. you know, to an investment management business. Yeah. And so, you know, I think it's really important uh, for consumers to understand what's the true DNA, mm -hmm. you know, of, of the organization. Um, is that, you know, in our case, we're a specialist company. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. It's everything we do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and look at track record, uh, you know, 10, 20 years uh, of investment track record. And, and, and look for transparency. Mm. So what does it say on the label and is there evidence um, that that company is, is putting the energy into making sure that, that what is delivered and what's in portfolios is, is, is actually true to the label? Thanks, John. Great to see you. John McBurno, who's the CEO of Australian Ethical Investment. Well, it's been budget week and I want to talk to Paul Rickard about the stocks that will eventually benefit from what's in the budget. But first, I'd like to talk to him about the inflation number in the US, 4.2%, a lot higher than the consensus figure was around 3.5% or 36 um, Paul, what's your take on this inflation number? Do you think, it, as the central banks say, it's temporary, it'll drop? Look, I think the central banks are largely still on the money, Peter, but... Uh you know, because they had three one-off factors here that were would normally be not part of the core number, but they're actually in the core number. Things like, um, you know, second-hand cars, a big rebound. And we know what part of the reason why that's going up in the US because, you know, there's a shortage of chips, which is impacting the, the new vehicle market. Yeah. So um, there are a lot of one-offs in these numbers, but uh, and the market knows that. But that said, you know, there's increasing talk about inflation and you're seeing it in... I guess in commodity prices, and and maybe the central banks are going to be forced to move just a little bit quicker than they may like. But markets have been worried. This isn't the first time we've been worried about inflation, you know. No, and no. Uh, we've, if you go back over the last decade, you know, it's happened a lot of times. And and what I think people forget is that the the disruptive force of all the technology, you know, has meant in most cases, you know, companies can't lift prices, it depresses prices. and it depresses prices. So. I think the central banks are in that camp, Peter, but I, I, I guess the market at least has moved on and saying, OK, we don't think it's as bad as those numbers, but um, we do think they're going to have to, you know, the, the scenario, say the Australian scenario that we know increase in interest rates in 2024, I think the Fed is for another couple of years, I think the market doesn't believe that. Yeah. And it's, it's starting to factor in some change, uh, if not this year in terms of the tapering, it's certainly by interest rates sometime next year. Yeah. It seems to me, Paul, that um, what I'm surprised about, when you look at the budget numbers, you've got 22, 23, 21, 22% growing at 4.25%. Mm -hmm. And then the year after, they reckon it's 2.5%. So if you're getting less growth, you shouldn't have an inflation problem, should you? No, you shouldn't, Peter. And that's a, it's, it's a, probably the most interesting thing in that budget document is, is, the, uh, is the big change between 21, 22 and 22, 23. Yeah. Um, so, look, I mean, I think, you know, we're, I'm not too worried about inflation, Peter, but I can sense the market over a number of weeks and months is getting a little more concerned. I think they'll get over this, but, you know, they'll, they'll be on edge now for the next set of data. So they're, looking at, they're going to need some positive reassurance. Okay, so we know there's the old saying, selling may and go away. It's looking like it's going to work this year. But the flip side is, if you want to make money, it would be buy in May, and stay, wouldn't it? Because you're going to get a lot of good companies at low prices. Well, we're going to come back to the question about what else can you invest in. And even if you, you do think, you know, that uh, the Fed at some stage this year, you know, stops its tapering program and then, uh, you know, maybe next year starts to talk about an interest rate increase or two, we're coming off just such a low base, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you know, how, how it, it, it's really going to have, apart from the psyche, the psyche is very different, but... Uh, in terms of the real cost for people and the and the cost that investors are going to look at, it doesn't going to mean much change. Okay, so let's put the inflation story behind you. Let's just believe that the pointy-head academics at the central banks know more about inflation than the money speculators on Wall Street. Eh? Yeah, what do you reckon? Paul? And, and yeah, I they think could be smarter. They could be smarter. And look, I mean, they've been so adamant. I mean, that's the interesting thing about our governor. Yeah. He's just been so. Yeah. He, I mean, he he could have sort of just sort of. Yeah, you make a state, you make a statement when you don't. You know, you want to leave yourself a little bit of room, yeah. but it's just been, you know, time after time, yeah. you know, not at the earliest, you know, at the absolute earliest, 2024. Um, it's, like, it's, it's the Cindy Lauper syndrome. Time after time, rates will not go up to 2024. Okay, let's look at what we we're initially going to talk about. The budget's there. 
what companies do you think are going to be favoured by all the spending, the tax cuts, the infrastructure spend that you see in this budget? Look, I think there are three obvious categories, Peter. Um, that is the so-called uh, retailers and consumer discretionary area, uh, aged care, and then thirdly, um, you know, builders and people, yeah. people involved in construction. That doesn't mean they go for a run straight after the budget. In many cases, you know, they get bought up ahead of the budget. So when the budget comes, you know, they get sold yeah. off a little bit. Yeah. So you have to get your timing right. But but they do have have some tailwinds. So on the consumer discretionary side, you know, let, let's look at, at, at all the big announcements. The most important one was the continuation of the, you call it the Lamington, uh, yeah. the low and middle tax income tax offset, right? Yeah. But uh, that means it's money. It's a really lame um, tag, isn't it? Lamington. It is. I think something like about 12.1 million Australians will get it, right? Yeah. And many of those people will get the, the 1,060 or 2,100 and... 20? 20 it must be <laughs> yeah. for a couple, yeah. uh, you know, as, as, a, as effectively when they do their tax return in, 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 you know, August, September, October. So we saw last year that it had a huge impact uh, on consumer spending. So retail's good. Yep. We've got the continuation of the instant asset write-off for business. We've got mm -hmm. the loss ca carry back and a whole lot of other things. That means that businesses are going to keep investing, you know, you know, cafes are going to be ordering cappuccino machines. Uh, you know, a lot of tradies are going to be buying new utes and cars. Mm. And so, uh, and a lot of money is going to be spent at, 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 at Bunnings and at JB Hi-Fi and Harvey Norman. So put all those together, you know, that retailing environment, uh, the JB Hi-Fi's, the, the Harvey Norman's, um, West Farmers, of course, owns Bunnings and Kmart's. And Coles. And, and Cole, Coles as a, as a, as a company. Uh, and also companies like AP Eagers, which of course is involved in the automotive trade and yeah. uh, even Babcorp. They're all going to benefit because there's so much money going to be continued to spend, be spent and can't be spent overseas. That's right, because right? the borders aren't opening up as quick as yeah. we thought, because pr primarily because the AstraZeneca uh, issue it hasn't been great for our borders reopening. But okay, it means $69 billion is here rather than going overseas with the tourists. Yeah, so that, that, that's a fabulous tale. The second category is, is in health, is in aged care. Mm. Now, aged care companies got really badly sold off on the head of the uh, Royal Commission. They have rallied quite substantially. Mm. And you've got to be a little bit careful of this because you could argue that, you know, whenever government's spending a lot of money and putting a whole lot of new rules, and sometimes that leads to a lot more cost. But if the government's putting in, you know, $17.7 .7 billion, and a fair chunk of that's going into residential aged care, you yeah. know, it's probably got to mean opportunities for the aged care provider. Something yeah. will go to their bottom line. I yeah. mean, they're going to, there's going to be an extra $10 a day. Mm. Yeah, sure, they're going to have extra costs, but I, I guess that there's probably going to be more positives than negatives for the aged care providers. What's your favourite one for you, Bill? Well, Japara is currently under a takeover offer or an indicative office, but you've got, you've got companies like uh, Regis Healthcare and uh, Estia. Uh, look, uh, you want to check them out pretty carefully. I'm not going to put a recommendation yeah. on either, but um, look, they're, they're, they're some of the companies involved in this. I know Tony Featherston, who writes exclusively uh, in the Switzer Report, he really likes a company called Lifestyle Communities. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and again, it's done well too. And it's it? done really well. So there's a couple of others in that category. If you want to see the others, you'll need to get the Switzer Report to do that. Um, so, but that's normally when governments throw money at a problem, yeah. that's tip generally good for the commercial yeah. providers in that space, yeah, right? We, we see it with education businesses when there's something that helps foreign tourists yeah. come to the country for education, their share price. Yeah, is so that's, that's, that probably is a good tailwind. And then the third one is again, government's throwing a lot of money at the whole, you know, home building, construction, infrastructure sectors, yeah. uh, with homemakers, with improvements to things like the first home super saver scheme for, for saving for a home package, yeah. uh, and a couple of other initiatives. There's home loan guarantees for single parents yep. and for, for young new, new home buyers, yeah. An extra, you know, $15.2 billion in infrastructure on, on over 10 years. No, it's over 10 years. but. But these are good long-term tailwinds. So they don't it's not necessarily translate tomorrow in a whole lot of orders, but they do over the medium term uh, support companies in that sector. So that's the third area um, I've been and looking at. And what companies do you like in the, in the construction? Area? Well, I really like Lend Lease, Peter, but it's not so much a construction company these days. It's more a uh, development and a funds manager. It's not doing a lot, but, you know, Ad is involved in the line business. You've got companies like CSR, Borrell, um, James Hardy, 
Uh, you know, there's other. And Kerry Stokes likes Boral. Yeah, you know, there's, there's, so there's there are other factors involved in some of these companies. You got to be look a bit harder at. Um, I mean, companies like Brickworks, you know, which is seems to go a bit off the radar, but it uh, is a good solid little performer. Uh, you know, they've got companies involved in the actual sort of development, AV Jennings, in terms of you know, building sites. You might even say that some of the mortgage brokers and others continue to benefit yeah. simply from you know, the, the, the tailwinds in that sector. So a lot of activity, that's got to be good for, uh, I'd rather have tailwinds than headwinds mm. when I'm investing. Uh, so they're the sort of third group. One I'll last one, at. Paul, then. Is, has the budget been good for the bank share price? Yeah, Peter, it hasn't been a negative, And I guess that because it's trying to do a lot to stimulate growth, mm. um, you've got to say that's, that's, that's a positive. Yeah. And uh, so all that money is going to find its way into the banks, but also you know, should help the demand for loans keep going on the business side. Mm. And uh, so it's a so very positive. I mean, some would argue that longer term, that's going to help growth leads to better outcomes, higher interest rates, and that's a positive for yeah. banks. Um, look, probably uh, I, you have to say it, it's, it's more of a positive than a negative, but it's hard to, you know, translate that into uh, any necessarily short-term impact. Yeah. I, think, I think the gains have been already factored into the banks. We know that the CBAs head off towards you know, 90, what, 95, yep. 96? 95 dollars, 96. It, was, it broke a new all-time high, I think, uh, on, uh, on Tuesday yeah. or, or Wednesday was. Yeah, and I think if an economy is going to actually grow over 4%, the banks were beneficiaries. But the, the really good gains have already been had. Uh, thanks, Paul, for joining the program. Thanks, Peter. Well, joining me now is the founder of uh, M Squared Capital, uh, Paul Mirren. And we want to talk about the outlook for inflation and the implication for interest rates and therefore the kind of investments you might be interested in as a consequence of, of that. Paul, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank now, you. Mate, I know you wrote a story for your, your client base mm -hmm. and you were actually talking about the outlook for inflation. Now, most of us think inflation is going to remain low, but mm. you, you made the point there's going to be one quarter where it's going to be a whopper or a whopper or yeah, a bopper? A whopper, a whopper, a whopper. A whopper. Okay. not a bummer. A whopper. <laughs> okay. and, so, and I, I, I quickly went to the, the Reserve yeah. Bank uh, chart to see if you were right, and you were. And, you. and they basically said it goes from 0.9% uh, for a quarter, yep. jumps up to three, then comes back to one and a half or one and three yes. quarters. So up and down. Explain to the audience why inflation will kick once, and there'll be a headline, inflation kicks. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, I think it's important to start saying why inflation is so important. Yeah. Um, I think it's been for couple of decades now that we haven't really talked about inflation for a very long time because mm. it's been under control, it's mm. been very subdued. But the reason why inflation is so topical at the moment is that if inflation goes higher than 3-4%, mm. what will it do to the economy? Mm. And with the low interest rates, if the Reserve Bank has to increase, inter has to increase interest rates to get on top of inflation, mm. it could actually put the economy back into a bit of a tailspin. It won't yeah, give it enough time to recover. Could be a recession. If, it, right. if they really get out of control with inflation, they'd have to raise interest rates. Sure. And that would really hurt a lot of businesses and a lot of borrowers who are expecting this to stay low at least to 2023. And, and so inflation can be very good for the economy. Yeah. So the right combination mm. of inflation, which is a steady, within the range, within the yeah. Goldilocks amount, which between two and 3% yeah. is the ideal yeah. amount. Yeah. Because what it does, it creates a business confidence, mm. it allows uh, wages growth, it, it allows everything to kick, kick yeah. through. Feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. I guess a business that is afraid to raise a price is a business that's afraid, hasn't got confidence in their own invest. Yeah. But if they think they are customers who really like their stuff, will pay a slightly higher price, they'll employ more people, they'll invest more in their business and so on and so forth. So we Exactly. Get, yeah. So look, and going back to your first question, mm. um, why I think the next quarter will be a whopper is that you have to look at COVID, you have to look at the economy and look at the data in three sections. Mm. What was happening before COVID? during COVID and post COVID. Mm. And so the last inflation figure that we received was 1.1% um, per, per that qu mm. quarter. The largest component was petrol. Mm. Okay, so w is petrol prices today more than it was pre-COVID? Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't. Mm. But from a statistical perspective, because it went down, down. so low yeah. and then it goes back up yeah. because we started driving cars, mm. that is what the inflation figure, why the inflation figure was 1.1. Yeah. Yeah. The next one is gonna be reflective of the other items. 
Mm. So when we were spending other items that we were spending money pre-COVID. Mm. So, so therefore, there's going to be a lag relationship in relation to us looking at real data and comparing it to the previous quarters. Yeah. So we're going to have this, we can't really rely yeah, a one on... one-off spike. A one-off spike. And so it's not the kind of inflation spike that will worry the Reserve Bank, and therefore people out there shouldn't worry about interest rates rising as a consequence of yeah. this big number that we'll see in the future. And I think uh, in today, Josh Frydenberg will be announcing, obviously people will be seeing this on, on Thursday, but mm. Josh Frydenberg will be announcing the budget today. Mm. The, it's really interesting to know that the Reserve Bank is very confident understanding where the figures are. Now, understand the statistical imbalances in relation to the, this information. Um, so the conversation will be all about jobs. Mm. It's all about trying to get our economy back to full capacity. Mm. And then when we get our economy back to full capacity, which will take probably three to four years, mm. then interest rates will start coming up. And inflation will go up, and interest rates will go up and so forth. Okay, so we're, we're living through a period of very low interest rates. Mm. What is this doing in relation to your business? Because yeah, your business is basically lending to uh, businesses, mm -hmm. uh, developers, all those sort of people who might can't get, well, they can get money from banks, I guess, but at very expensive rates yeah. um, because they're a little bit more risky than other activities. And so then people come to you <laughs> saying, say, well, we are like bank, bank deposits being so low, they're supersonically safe, but I can't live on half a percent. Sure. You guys offer more, so there's more risk according, accordingly, and you try to reduce those risks, but What's it doing for your business, all this low interest rate? Well, it's, it's fantastic for our business because it, what it does, it pronounces the need for people to invest mm. in something. Like it's giving them a yield mm. that is consistent and most importantly, it's secured by something they can sleep at night. Mm. So all of our mortgages that we do, mostly it's all first mortgage, registered mortgages. Mm. So for, as an example that we use all the time, if there's a million dollar property, we're not lending more than $650,000, which is 65%. Mm. So Historically speaking, we haven't seen the property market fall more than 20% in any short period yeah. of time. So the security behind that loan will be that person's ha a property. And house prices will have to fall by 30 35% before there was a, a, a worry around someone giving you money. Yeah. And, okay. and, and look, yeah. and, and the drop in price is the worst case scenario. It's mm. only in an unlikely event of someone defaulting and that we have to take recovery action. Yeah. Look, most borrowers are very responsible people. Mm. If we're lending money to the right people, they will know that mm. they're in trouble and they'll go and sell the property even before we have to intervene. Yeah. But for the 1% of people who are reluctant to do so on mm. their own, we might have to give them a bit of a push. Okay, and, and because you have a, a range of different um, uh, potential um, people you lend to yes. and different levels of risk, yes. you therefore, the people who give you money, can kind of select the level of risk and therefore the level of return. Is that right? Absolutely. And you're pinpointing to your favourite word, which is a contributory mortgage fund. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hate that word. No one <laughs> understands what he's talking about. A contributory mortgage fund, basically, as you, pretty much people have two options. Mm. They have an ability, to, if, when they're investing into mortgage funds, they can do into a pool fund, which yeah. has 50, 60 different mortgages. But of different quality and all that quality, sort of stuff. Different so they average out. Mixed, average out. Yeah. Uh, what we do, we give it the ability for our investors to choose the one best for them. I would call it a targeted loan. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. what it really is, isn't it? Yeah. I lend to this project, Absolutely. to this borrower, borrower. and, or the, or and I'm like comfortable with that. I know it's more risky than a, than a bank deposit, yeah. but at least I'm selecting it and I'm weighing up the return to the risk. And you know what? It gives a power to the investor. Hmm. The, the reason why we set it up this way is that we, we believe that mortgages is not a homogenous good. Yeah. It is every single one. We've been doing that. <laughs> been, um, I've, I've been lending mo uh, money since I was 19 years old when I was working in the bank. Yeah. The, All two years. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Peter. Um, the best thing about it is that mortgages, uh, and I know that it can be a very boring topic in comparison to the other things yeah. you talk about, but it is quite interesting, is that there are so much variety in mortgages. You know, you could be doing a first mortgage against an apartment in the city which is only 50%. Or, mm. as you said, on the other spectrum, you could have a construction deal there um, where it's a lot more dynamic, a lot more interesting, different type of risks, but our investors get uh, rewarded for a high return for it. Mm. So it really puts a lot more power with our investors to actually make the choice and to construct their own portfolio, which I think is really, really important. Well, them. the last obvious question is, we, we started off on inflation. What if, you know, b by surprise, mm. inflation goes to three and stays high at three, what's that do for your business? 
Well, you know what? Property is a natural hedge against mm. inflation. Mm. So the value of the assets such as property do go up. Okay. So um, it doesn't, does, doesn't actually increase the risk profile that much. Yeah. Look, we're very cautious in looking at inflation from a different perspective, probably from a more of a social perspective because you don't want to have, for example, hyperinflation as well. So therefore, I'm really look, if in that circumstance, I'm going to be looking at people's cash flows a lot more carefully when assessing a mortgage, yeah. not necessarily the security. So I guess in the short term, if we're getting inflation, it's probably going to be a stronger economy and therefore it's better than a serious recession where one day house prices might fall by 40%, though yeah. historically we've never seen that happen. Absolutely. It would be Great Depression and in the Great Depression, I think even the banks would be in trouble. Sure. That's Paul Merrin from M Squared Capital.